markers of the field. I don't write for publication. I don't have an academic practice. Um, I, I, at times, I've thought of uh, visual and critical studies um, more in the general sense that maybe some of what uh, that may be familiar to many dual degrees in that um, it's engaging with critical theories becomes this important way to defend or articulate our work as it goes out into the world, um, you know, to define it for ourselves before others define it for us. Um, but in more recent years, I've come to understand and appreciate the ways that um, the tools that I've gained through visual and critical studies are deeply embedded in my practice and how I navigate the world as an artist and cultural worker. Um, while here at CCA, I actually had two potential thesis uh, topics that I was investigating. Um, the first, which emerged from the research that I was conducting for my studio work, um, was a look at a site in southeast Los Angeles County where a juvenile hall is wrapped in the manicured greens of a public golf course in the middle of the suburban landscape. Um, that juxtaposition of spaces when run by the county probation department and the other by Rock and Parks, while initially jarring and troubling, perfectly encapsulates the binaries that shape our broader society, um, the outside only being possible because of who's kept hidden inside, criminalization, defining freedom, incarceration, enabling, leisure. This space also speaks to questions of who is visible or invisible, until more, the more recent advent of Google Street View, most maps online or in print represented the juvenile hall as a blank block in the middle of the named golf course, a mysterious donut hole in the middle of the playground. This cartographic invisibility carries over to the pedestrian view of the landscape where a casual passerby um, might never realize the significance of the buildings that, they, um, that are barely visible through the trees and sand traps. That invisibility in turn functions as a tool to protect property value in the suburb that in its founding documents declared itself as an escape from the taxes and the crime of the big city. After all, how much better for the real estate market to live near a golf course than a carceral space? But by midway through the program, I exhausted most of that writing. Um, it was research that, because it drove my student practice, it was more um, ultimately uh, more effective to, to use other modes to, to continue uh, delving into that work. Um, instead, I ended up shifting gears to write about a framework, um, as you heard, uh, that I called pirate futurism to discuss the work of Asian American artists who use speculative narratives to complicate expectations of loyalty and disloyalty, belonging and expected allegiances. Piracy could be used to describe an artistic practice, the appropriation of elements from pop culture to construct alternative narratives, and an anarchistic social position, as, uh, as with Peter Langwell and Marcus Redeker's invocation of pirates as a polycultural uh, grouping whose strategic loyalty suggested possibilities of allegiances beyond the restrictions of nation states or regressive institutions. I was working on this near the height of post-identity discourse in the art world, and I wanted to explore Asian American artists' work that sometimes resisted attempts to talk about it in relation to fixed identities, to have a framework that could be slippery and expansive, um, but still allow for the acknowledgement of Asian American social politics and legacies of coalition building. Those co core ideas and the tools I learned to dis dissect them are integral to continuing my continuing practice as an artist and cultural worker. Most of my work nowadays is, as a writer is very utilitarian. I write grants and planning documents for cultural organizations. My focus tends to be on the relationship of creative work to arts policy and um, gathering resources. For instance, I have an ongoing relationship with Soma Filipinas, the Filipino Cultural Heritage District in the South Market of San Francisco that was formally recognized a few years ago. The neighborhood has been the center for SS Filipino community since the erasure of Manila Town during the expansion of the financial district. Soma Filipinas is the formalization of years of organizing against the waves of gentrification that have eroded the community's life in the neighborhood. First with the redevelopment era that birthed the Yerbabuena district, um, then the building of Westfield, and now the current era of high density and luxury investments. Because of its layout, much of the long-term residential life of the neighborhood is in side streets and alleyways, out of view of the commercial corridor and new high rises. It's also a neighborhood that's always been multi-layered. It's where working class families, Filipino community, and LGBT folks carved out space together. For instance, the first Folsom Street Fair was themed Megahood, and articulated a vision of being a space where all of these groups could gather together and celebrate in solidarity with the queer leather community, 
celebrating the streets to defy celebrating in the streets to defy the specter of increasing displacement. So unlike some culture of the shirts that have arisen from ethnic enclaves, the strategy around keeping place is different and can't rely on existing visibility, density, or a monocultural identification. This work in Soma raises many of the same questions that I've coupled with in visual and critical studies and that continue to be relevant. What are the social dynamics and facets of the built environment that render parts of the community visible? How does this impact policy making and who is prioritized in the neighborhood? And what is the role that culture and art can play in shifting those dynamics? Since this is a polycultural neighborhood, what are the possibilities for coalition building and strategic allegiances that simultaneously leave room for clear districts, uh, clear cultural identities in the district? In my studio practice, I've come to appreciate the ways that visual and critical studies is far more than a defensive tool. When I was in undergrad, uh, I thought the greatest compliment my painting advisor paid me was telling me during thesis reviews, I still don't like your work, but I respect that you can argue for it. <laughs> as I've worked to sustain my practice, I appreciate BCS more and more as a process of learning, of seeing the world, and finding openings to be investigated through different modes, whether through art making or writing. In the MFA process, I remember being told that in the longer arc of our careers, it was more important to use our time in school to find ways to generate new ideas, to understand how we develop concepts, than to create successful work right out of the gate. At the time, I mistakenly thought that this was a studio practice, a studio process, and that I needed to create an expansive visual vocabulary that would solve all my problems. Um, but if anything, I find that it's a process of looking, reading the landscape and archives, um, talking to people, um, and making as well, of course. Um, but as all modes of thinking about place that dig into narratives presented by places and sites um, to understand what they say about belonging, who controls that story, who benefits from those um, investments, and who can, how we can resist um, the, the pull of those dominant narratives. So thank you again for, for this honor and this recognition. Um, the, I really value visual and critical studies as a way of seeing and conversing with, with the world, um, whose roots are in the textual theory and academic research, but whose outputs and inflections are flexible and grant us the tools to engage with the world as makers, advocates, writers, and members of a community body. Thank you.